So this morning uh, I want to talk to you about marriage, road rage and divorce. <laughs> but first uh, I want to talk to you about the residents of La Conchita. On the 10th of January 2005, 400,000 tonnes of rock, mud and dirt slid down the mountain behind the Californian beachside town of La Conchita. Seven adults, three children were killed. One minute they are sleeping peacefully in their beds. The next minute they are buried alive in dark, freezing mud. Now what was interesting about this disaster is that it happened ten years after another landslide on that exact same mountain, in that exact same town, killed nine people. In fact, deadly landslides happen in La Conchita all the time. They have to because the town is built on what geologists call a prehistoric slide. For tens of thousands of years, this mountain has quite literally been sliding into the ocean, and it cannot be stopped. So for the residents of La Conchita, it's not a matter of if more of them are going to be buried alive, it's just a matter of when. So let's say you've bought a half million dollar ocean view home in La Conchita. Owning this home creates what your shrink calls cognitive dissonance. This is the tension in your head caused when you hold two inconsistent truths at the same time. Inconsistent ideas, beliefs or behaviours. On the one hand, you actually chose to buy a half million dollar property in a disaster movie. <laughs> that makes you an idiot. <laughs> However, on the other hand, you just spent half a million dollars on this thing. This creates a tension between your idiocy and what you did. And so to reduce this tension and to justify buying a home that might one day become your tomb, <coughs> You begin to justify your behaviour that allows you, in a way that allows you to maintain the delusion that you are smart and right when clearly you are dumb and wrong. So you might say to yourself, well, where else in California could I buy an ocean view home for half a million dollars? It's such a lovely community. It's small. A lot of the residents moved out, there's not many left. <laughs> There's a great coffee shop and the Wi-Fi always works. And anyway, it's been so long since there was a slide. And if you'd invested a half million dollars into that home, you would have to create those fictions in your head because that's a lot on the line for you. Now, as you've already gathered, I'm not really talking about La Conchita or about a half million dollars. I'm really talking about the years of our lives that we have invested in our relationships. When you meet someone and you fall in love, you begin to plan your future and you approach that planning with dreams, desires, wishes of what you think your future marriage will look like. So we say when we get married, I understand that we'll live in a, an apartment for a while and then after that we'll move into a townhome but eventually we'll probably live in a 4,000 square foot home. I imagine that we'll have three children. I imagine that there will be roles that my wife will fulfill. I imagine that the house will always be clean and that she will always look perfect. I imagine that her cooking will be just as good, if not better, than my mum's. And my mum was Italian. <laughs> I imagine that we'll be very successful together. I imagine that I'll be able to drive one of those. I imagine that our schedule will allow us to spend lots of quality time together. He'll always be home. He won't work too much and the soccer game will always be attended. I imagine that we'll have two vacations a year, one in winter, one in spring, and one in summer. That's three, but that's not important. It's the vacations that matter. I have a very clear idea of what my wife will wear in bed, and I have a very clear idea of how my husband will always treat me, right? Each of us come into our relationships with a, le with a list of these dreams. And they may be subconscious, but they're always there. And the thing that these desires have in common is I. Uh, this is what I desire, this is what I envisage, this is what I feel our future is going to look like, this is what I assume. 
And I can't be faulted for that, because what else can I do but think about the things that I would wish for? And so we come to our wedding day, um, and we have all, you know, we have flowers, we have bridesmaids, we have tuxedos, we have bow ties, but mainly we have these subconscious desires. And then at some point, shortly after saying I do, maybe at the end of the aisle, maybe halfway through the honeymoon, maybe at the end of the first year, we transfer these desires into a different category. They're no longer desires, now they're expectations. The husband has expectations, the wife has expectations, and very quickly, these expectations begin to not get met. And so now you have dissonance to deal with. Because, on the one hand, you actually fell in love with this person. Of your own free will and volition, you loved them. You married them. You got involved with them. But now, on the other hand, it's not perfect. Expectations are not being met. It doesn't seem to be working as well as I thought. And so to resolve this tension between what you did and where you're at, you create these fictions. Fictions that allow you to maintain your belief that you are 100% right. And that's the big takeaway from this morning. Doesn't matter what I say, that's what you're going to hear. You're right. You're right to feel the way you feel. They're wrong. Okay. So here's the first fiction that you can play with. You can separate. Fantastic. Fantastic. So we can decide, hey, look, I'm not meeting your expectations. You certainly are not meeting my expectations. This isn't what I expected. This isn't how I imagined things to be. You're not the sort of wife I think I need. You're not the sort of husband I really want. So I'm going to pick up my desires and keep looking for something better. And the great thing about doing this is that you still get to be right. Now, as, as, as many of you know, going down this road or being forced to go down this road creates a fair bit of tension in your own head. So, if you're the one being left, if you're the one whose partner pulled the trigger and said, that's it, we're done, you're left with the ego-crushing dissonance of thinking, well, here I am, I'm a good person, and I've been an amazing partner. How could this have happened to someone like me? And you deal with this dissonance in one of two ways. Either you can say, well, maybe I'm not a good person. Or maybe, maybe I am a good person, but maybe I wasn't a great partner. Or you can say, my ex was crazy. <laughs> they weren't always crazy, but, but they just went crazy, and that's why they did what they did. And the latter op option is the easiest and most obvious. And that's why we always take that option because it allows us to maintain the delusion that we're 100% right and they're 100% wrong. And if you're the one doing the leaving, if you're the one pulling the trigger and saying that's it, we're done, you play the same trick in reverse. You have to because the fact is you're inflicting pain on somebody you once loved. And to reduce the dissonance that that pain creates, you make a fiction in your head where you end up being right to do what you did. And so you come up with a list of reasons why they deserved what you did to them. This is why if you've ever gone through this yourself or you've ever tried to, to help a divorcing couple, you'll have experienced the weirdness of otherwise completely rational seeing people behaving in completely unreasonable ways. And what you're seeing in that situation is this tension, this dissonance in action. In order for you to maintain the fiction that you are smart, moral, and right, you have to vilify the other person as being 100% wrong all the time. And this is why you'll, you will fight about every last penny. Why you'll argue about five minutes of visitation. Everything becomes a battleground. And it's not about the money. And it's not about the five minutes. It's about you needing to justify your position that you are right and they are wrong. It's so rare, on the other hand, for us to just say, well, well, this sucks, but maybe I wasn't as good a partner as I thought I was. Maybe this is a wake-up call for me. Or to say, 
what I'm about to do is really nasty. But you know what? I'm going to do it anyway because I'm selfish and it's all about me. <coughs> so what do you want? <laughs> so that's an idea. Uh, another fiction that we can uh, go with is that the stronger partner can impose his or her will on the weaker partner. Um, so it's quite common in a marriage, isn't it? For either the husband or the wife to dominate the relationship. Uh, so, for example, the expectations of the husband are explained and explained and explained until finally she gets it. Uh, the expectations of the wife are explained and explained and explained until she finally, thank goodness, she now understands what it takes to be a good wife. Um, now, now, after all these years, after all these years of teaching and tutoring, um, they, they can begin to meet my expectations. And as we explain it and explain it, and as they get it and they get it, you on your end of the fence can begin to feel that the marriage is finally working. But what they're doing on their end of the fence is raising up the white flag and saying, okay, I give up. I surrender. If that's what it takes, if that's the way your mother did it, if that's the way your father handled money, if that's the way he behaved around the home, if this is what it takes for you to feel that this marriage is working, then I'll raise a big white flag and I'll surrender and you can have your way. Our need to be right all the time is unchristian. It's fundamentally unchristian. And it prevents us from seeing the other person's point of view and seeing their position and their wishes as being legitimate. And when we're like this, what happens in every single conflict is that it becomes about two things. I'm right, and you're wrong. It's always about that. I'm right, you're wrong. And even if I'm wrong, too bad, because that's the way I am. So not long ago, uh, I, was, I was driving in my car, and I stopped at a T-junction. And I was waiting for a safe gap in the traffic to pull out, and the gentleman behind me didn't appreciate my slowness, so he began pumping his horn, and uh, he began waving his arms. He was from a Mediterranean background, I was guessing. <laughs> Giving it all this, you know. And uh, when I was driving, uh, I was listening to a podcast of the teachings of Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic philosopher. So hitherto, I was in a moment of optimal Zen. But when I looked into my rear view mirror, and saw this Mediterranean gentleman giving it this. In 0 0.7 seconds, I went from optimal Zen to full-on Braveheart. <laughs> so, actually, you probably shouldn't laugh because it's wrong. So I put my car in park. Oh, no. I get out of the car. Oh, no. I know. I walk. I stride over to this gentleman's car. And I make a very forceful point, the details of which I can't remember. <laughs> the mist of rage does that to your memory. I walk back over to my car in a John Wayne type fashion. And I get back into my car and as soon as I put my seatbelt on, I'm hit with an instant feeling of shame and stupidity. No question what I just did was wrong, idiotic, and very ill-advised. Fair enough? Right. Sometime later, I don't know if it was that day or that week or whatever, but I'm, I'm, I'm buying groceries in Foodland and there's a little old lady in the checkout line in front of me and she can't afford to buy her groceries. So I did what every single one of you would have done. I buy, but she, she put the broccoli back, she couldn't afford the broccoli, so I paid for her broccoli. Right? Now, question. Why did I indulge in road rage? And why did I buy broccoli for an old lady? Very simple. The road rage was all about circumstances. It wasn't me, it was the situation. Maybe I was subconsciously stressed, maybe I'd seen a road traffic accident earlier that day, I didn't appreciate being pushed out into traffic. It was all about the circumstances and the situation, not about me. The reason I bought groceries for an old lady is because I'm a good guy. That wasn't about the situation. That was all about what I liked to the core. If you sliced me down the middle, you'd find a good guy who buys old ladies groceries, written <laughs> all the way to the middle. 
When I do something good, it's because that's who I am. When I do something bad, it's because of the situation. That's the fiction we all tell ourselves, right? Right? And I've noticed that successful relationships extend to each other the same self-forgiving ways of thinking that we extend to ourselves. So they forgive each other's missteps as being entirely due to the situation. And they credit the thoughtful, kind things that they do for each other as being that's what they're like. So if one partner is in a bad mood or forgets an anniversary or a birthday, the other partner writes it off while well, they're under stress right now. They've got a bad back. They're just busy. But when they do something nice, it's because they're the best husband in the world. The, good, the bad is written off. The good is because of that's who they are. And while happy partners are giving each other the benefit of the doubt, I've noticed that unhappy partners are doing the opposite. So when they do something nice, it's never good enough. When the husband brings home flowers, it's the wrong colour. Or when they make a mistake, right, here's a bad one, they make a mistake, right? The wife makes a mistake, and the husband just doesn't say, well, it's just a mistake, it's because of the situation. No, no, no. They make the mistake because that's what they're like. They're just like their mother. Or something. It's to do with their fundamental character. Now this matters because if I argue with you on the premise that you're a good person who made a mistake, then that gives us a lot of leg room. But if I argue with you that you're a bad person and making mistakes is just what you're like, then where do we go from there? So research was done a while ago. They, they uh, researched 50 couples that were not long married. And the researchers were able to predict with 100% accuracy which of the couples would be divorced five years later. <coughs> Astonishing. And it all had to do with the contempt that they showed one another in the relationship. So here's a classic conversation. The husband says to the wife, did you pick up my dry cleaning? The wife says, what am I, your maid? And the husband says, well, if you were, you were my maid, at least you'd know how to clean. <laughs> Little, now I know you would never say this, but little exchanges like this, researchers have found, are accurate predictors of a relationship not working because they indicate a fundamental contempt, a fundamental bad view of the other. So there's another option, you don't have to separate, you don't have to conquer and subdue, you could just become bitter, this is awesome. Uh, so if the husband is dumping his expectations on the wife and the wife is dumping her expectations on the husband and, and if the marriage is based on expectations, eventually things are going to become bitter. So, so you know, you're the wife, you owe me. You owe me this stuff. Remember we spoke about this and I would go to work and I would do my thing and you would do your thing and, and there would be certain things at home, certain expectations. Well, where's my prime rib? And, and you're the husband, you owe me. Why can't I have what my sister has? Why can't you make soccer practice again? You know, you swore that we would have. You swore that we would have time. We swore that we would do this and that. You owe me. And all of us can build a really convincing case for why we are owed stuff in life. And as justified as we may be in thinking that we are owed stuff in life, when a marriage, or any relationship actually, even a friendship, is based on expectations, eventually the goodness disappears. And if a marriage is all about expectations, eventually there can be no intimacy and no love. Right? If you expect that your wife will cook you a great meal, and she cooks you a great meal, well, all she did was meet your expectations. And all of her efforts towards that end were not in your eyes a gift of love and intimacy, merely a fulfillment of obligations. You know, uh, I've been paying my mortgage for a while now, every two weeks. Every two weeks for years I, I pay my mortgage on time. And you know what? No gratitude from the bank. <laughs> Zero. Never once have I had a pink, lacy, frilly envelope, perfume scented, from my bank manager. You don't get that? I know. Never once saying, darn, I just wanted to write you a little note saying how much we appreciate you. Apparently, paying my mortgage isn't a desire they have. 
It's an expectation. And in fact, the only time they will write to me is if I fail to meet expectations. If getting a great meal every night is a desire of mine and I get a great meal, then I'm grateful. Then I notice the effort that was made and recognize it for what it is, a gift of love, a symbol of our intimacy. However, if getting that is an expectation of mine and I get it, then I don't notice. The only way I notice is if I don't get it. When our marriage, listen carefully, is based on expectations, then we're in trouble because the best we can ever do is meet expectations. And then there's no room at all to give and receive love. And it all starts with our desires. And the solution to this is not to abandon desire and to pretend that they don't exist. I don't know about you, but I'm just not that spiritual. I have wants and so do you. And the wants that we have are good. Somewhere in here there's desires that are a direct consequence of the, main, of the way that God has made us uniquely as individuals. There's good stuff in here. So here's the question. Here's the thing to imagine. Single, married or divorced, whatever you are. Imagine a marriage built around trying to fulfill one another's desires rather than trying to live up to one another's expectations. Isn't that worth imagining? Imagine a marriage built around trying to fulfill one another's desires rather than trying to live up to one another's expectations. Now, what does our Christian text have to say about this? Writing to the church in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul says, talking now within a household context, he says, submit to one another. So what the Bible is saying here is that husbands should put the desires that their wife is, is, is expressing before their own, and the wives should put their, their husband's desires before their own. And that marriage should be a kind of argument, I suppose, about each person trying to, to meet the other person's desires. Not notice, troublingly, to make the marriage work, but rather as an expression of each person's fundamental Christian faith. So notice he says, submit to one another. Well, why would I do that? Out of reverence for Christ. So it's almost as if a person is having a conversation with God here and the conversation goes something like this. Uh, God, I'm just so grateful for all the things you've done for me. I'm grateful for my faith. Uh, I'm grateful for salvation. I'm grateful for the, you know, the assurance of heaven. I'm grateful for, for all the wonderful uh, things that Christianity is and, and, and means in my life. And I just want to you know, I just want to express how grateful I am to you. And God says, really, do you mean that? Yeah, I absolutely mean that. I want to live a genuine, Christian, authentic, believing, faith-filled life. That's what I want. I mean it. Okay. Submit to your partner. <laughs> Can I like, go on a mission trip or something? Like, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Then he gets specific. He says, wives... Submit to your husbands. Why? Because they're great husbands? No. Because they earned it? No. Notice he says, as to the Lord. So, so this thing about putting each other first, it's got something to do with Jesus. It seems there is a correlation between the relationship that a woman has with her husband and the relationship that that same woman has with her Christian faith. It's almost as if Jesus is saying in this text, do you know how submitted to me you are? Do you know how serious you are about this thing you have with me? Yes, well I want you to take that same thing and put all of that Christianity and worship and devotion and show it to your husband, not to me. Can't I just bake cookies for the homeless instead? Be easier. No. Because it seems that a part of what it means to have Jesus as your saviour and master involves submitting and, and helping the desires of your husband, finding what, out what those are and then fulfilling them. And then he goes on. I thought of it just stopping there and saying amen. 
<laughs> but he goes on, he says to the husbands, love your wives. Why? Because they're such great wives? Because they meet all your expectations? Because they have, you know, they, they tick all the narrow chauvinistic boxes that you, that you brought into the marriage? No. Because there's a correlation between the way a man treats his woman and the relationship that that same man has with his Christian faith. Hence, he's careful to say, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And gave himself up for her. So you see, there's, there's an insidious lie in modern Christianity that says Christian worship is primarily expressed in the Christian-y things we do. Like Christian worship. Or, or, or listening to Christian teaching. And, 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 and that's how I express my Christian faith. It's, it's in the singing of Christian songs. It's in, the, it's in the reading of Christian books. It's in the listening to Christian teaching. That is my primary expression of Christianity. And maybe I'll give some money to the poor if I feel extra saintly. This is a cop-out. That allows us to, to divorce our Christianity from our life. Christianity, according to the teaching of the Christian apostles, is mainly about how we treat other people. That's Christianity. And that treatment primarily is expressed in the most difficult place of all. With our partners, and with our children, and with our parents. And you know, I, you know, I get it. It's dark, but I can see the antagonism in your face. <laughs> so I get the pushback, okay? But pause for a moment and ask yourself, what would it be like to be in a marriage where your spouse was committed to your desires with an almost evangelical zeal? And to imagine a marriage where that commitment went both ways. It's worth imagining, isn't it? Now, the only way that you can have such a commitment is if you come to the conclusion that your spouse owes you nothing. The expectations are unhelpful. I'm really hoping there's no time for questions. <laughs> oh, damn, there is. Okay. I think... I just set you up for some really awesome conversations when you go home yeah. about desires, about expectations, about how things are. I think I just set you up for some really soul searching personal work. You're welcome. <laughs> Any questions, any of that? <laughs>